today, I'm interviewing George Musami, who's leading Safari Fund. They partner up with Safari DAO, one of the most vibrant DAO communities on the African continent. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, GM, GM. Hey, GM, GM, Tuck. Hey, George, how's it going? Oh, um, good. Yeah, really good to be talking to you today. Um, uh, yeah, I've known uh, George for for quite a uh, for a bit, um, and in our uh, pursuit uh, of Safari Dauphin together. In respect of that, I, I'm putting in pink, the color pink in the background, um, as that is kind of the colors of Safari Dao Fund. Um, so yeah, tell me very quickly, you know, 15, 20 second background of, um, uh, of what you've done and, and uh, now kind of your work at Safari Dao Fund. Oh, for sure, Doug. It's first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've spent the last 10 years or so being an angel investor in a couple of projects, you know, some of them going ahead successfully. And we came together with a couple of friends uh, so the opportunity to see what the world of Web3, the world of blockchain can offer to this continent. And yeah, it's very exciting to be here uh, to talk a little bit more about what our fund looks looks at, some of the investments we're looking to make and the criteria and our hopes and dreams. Um, and tell me about some of, before we get started into the actual fund, tell me about some of the angel investments that you made uh, before. Yeah, uh, so I participated in about four startups in the last maybe three years. Uh, one of them was a health lending application, and it got a successful round for the first the first pre-seed round, which was really uh, successful. But getting to market was very hard because we were struggling to form to seal the gap of the credit scoring element. As you might have seen on the continent, this is uh, this new opportunity of buy now, pay later. And we were trying to tap into that opportunity or the startup that I was working with was trying to tap into that opportunity. And it it was just a very difficult time because some of the first people who took up the loans were, were careful to try and pay them back. But then after a very short time, you know, people realized, hey, I can actually borrow and really not have any repercussions for not not paying back. So that, that ended up not completing its full course. Uh, but that was not the end. Uh, we, in the in part of that little venture arm um, that we got into, we also looked at a few other startups. One of them was uh, some applications for distributing water because we found that there's a big gap in the African market whereby users on one side have like a large demand of, uh, for water and water services and then you'd have these individual suppliers who would have to typically go around the estates or uh, sell water through these uh, very arbitrary means. So we were trying to see if we can find a way of creating a more efficient system, just getting that water to where the people people are. And that one's, I would say it's continuing on its journey slowly. Uh, it has great founders uh, who are continuously putting in the time to to improve their product. Um, there's a few others that we invested in. Maybe just one to note was, and, and it's still in the process of finding its way, is uh, one which was working with trying to help startups which have some form of traction and it was based on the micro acquire model and it was basically trying to make sure that these startups don't get lost the way for example the first one the health one uh, stopped on its on its tracks by bridging some of the knowledge that that these startups or the advisors from these startups would have had and would essentially coalesce some of that information to bridge it to the next round interesting Actually, kind of lean into that a little bit. So, you know, you, you've worked in the UK. I think about three, three to four years up in the uh, up in the Scottish uh, Highlands, I guess, uh, or maybe in islands of Scotland up in the north. Um, and then, and then, kind of investing in in is it kind of Pan Africa or is it only in Kenya? 
Uh, yeah, so my, my time in Scotland was spent working at, a, at an environmental renewable energy consultancy, and it was the largest one based on marine and tidal renewable energy. So really at the cutting edge of technology. And that's how I actually came about blockchain. People were, it was around 2014, between 2014 and 2016, everyone was talking about how the cost of mining is so high. Uh, can we find cheaper sources of uh, running these mining rigs? And the folks on the island I lived on, it's a tiny island called Hookney, off of the north of Scotland, had an abundance of renewable energy. We're producing about 109 percent of the of the of the island's energy needs. And so there was discussions of can we use some of this excess electricity to tap into the mining technology. And that's how, in the company I was working for, I, like my mind was just fascinated by how blockchain is so an, a, analogous to, uh, it, it completely matches the structure of distributed uh, ledgers. Uh, distributed energy and distributed ledgers work in more or less the same way. And that transition came, brought me, so in 2018, I, I was tired of living in the UK because I felt like I was so separate from the, the, the some of the things which the continent faces, the continent of Africa. For us in the UK, I felt like we were solving, we were making things which are already working just a little bit better. And, and here we had fundamental issues in, say, for example, distribution of power, uh, lack of access to capital. I, for example, having had a steady job in the UK, my bank manager would come and offer me, hey, can you, do you want to take a personal loan at 4% uh, interest per annum? In Kenya, even if you have like the most stable job at that time, you would only get a, a personal loan of 21% and it had to be, it had to be secured against some assets. And I thought we, this, it's, it's high time we shift this uh, you know, the, the shift the way things work on the continent. So when I came back in 2018, I had an opportunity to set up a block producer on the EOS platform, which was really, really cool. We ended up uh, being one the only African block producer, got us really in-depth into the blockchain sector. And that's how... I, f I felt like my eyes had been opened. There's so much opportunity. There's so much talent here. There's so many people who are working in the dev spaces. Uh, many software engineers who are now coming, uh, either graduating or are becoming self-taught. And the pl proliferation of um, information was now at pe people's fingertips. And and my I feel like my personal calling is to make sure that this, these startups or these ideas come into maturation and that means more jobs for people on the continent that means direct problems are being addressed by the people who live here and with lots of support from from the rest of the world so if i may summarize it, it sounds like basically in, in on the continent and and you're based out of kenya so I, there, there's i guess kenyan specific kind of issues and and startups but Kind of generally speaking on the continent, there's a lot of opportunity, lots of very fundamental uh, issues to solve that technology can solve. Um, and, and I guess that's the exciting part. There's just all this opportunity um, kind of to play for. That's really exciting. I'm sh I feel like we can really talk, uh, we could have talked more, much more about that as well. And I'm actually fascinated. But I do kind of want to move over to your work in the fund. What do you think is is uh, different about you know the work as about Safari DAO and the fund that you're creating, trying to create an answer to Safari DAO? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a that's a really good uh, segue. You know, one of the challenges or one of the unique things about running a DAO fund is that decision making moves from me as an individual or the set of people who initiated the fund to now the everyone else who's involved in the decision making. And the beauty about that is that you get such diverse and rich information, especially when you're coming from a fund that's basically covering the whole continent. You know, the Safari DAO fund will be, I think, the, one of the first ones. And we have members from Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, 
and other countries are also represented this we have Ghanaians we have Tanzanians and the important thing is to you know we we it's very easy from an external view to think of Africa as one one port with what with uh, the same problems cutting across the continent but when you're engaging in a in a in a fund like this one in a DAO fund you realize that each country has these very specific problems and the way that we approach them becomes very unique because we have the input from all the members and so the goal for or, or why why I would say this is a little bit different from you know your traditional VC is because the decision making uh, moves from just uh, us as managers and uh, as from the GPs and the LPs to having a little bit more diversity in terms of who we're looking at to give this support. And as you said, yeah, I you know, like sometimes people look at Africa with the problems, but you put it rightly, Africa is blessed with opportunities. And, you know, the goal of a, of a venture fund is to make sure that there's exponential growth, which everyone benefits as, as we tap into that sequential stage stages of growth. That's a really good kind of point. It's a double-edged sword, right? So, so on one hand, yes, you have kind of the, the diversity of opinions, um, and sometimes that can be too much. But on the other hand, it represents the diversity of the continent as a whole. And I guess, you know, some uh, working with a DAO, when you're starting to make investment decisions, you know, how you view it as a Kenyan might be very different from. The Ghanaian might say, well, that's not going to work in Ghana, uh, Ghana, right? And so mm-hmm. having that insight is super valuable because otherwise you, you just wouldn't know. Right? Yes. yes, exactly. And and just as you said, if, uh, say, for example, a startup approaches us from Ghana and there's some things which maybe Ghana has already gone ahead, that gives us an opportunity to share some of that those learnings with the, with a startup from Kenya and vice versa. So there's not only the cross platform, cross country learning, but there's also the opportunity to you make sure that mistakes are not repeated, and I think this gives us an opportunity to be really successful very quickly, because some of the products, uh, as much as the problems might be a little bit different at the baseline, execution of those products allows them to spread across the whole the whole continent. So take, for example, if uh, let's say this the healthcare startup comes to us, uh, they have, a, say, a Web3 solution that helps users uh, pin down or lock down their, their digital information in such a way that it's only accessible to them and they choose who to, to give it to. And at the same time, they're able to get as many customers on that platform, getting some of that growth in one country becomes easier because they are now getting connections across the DAO fund and the expansion into another region becomes very, very easy. Another thing that kind of appealed to me about kind of Safari DAO and Safari DAO fund, you know, aside from the team members, is actually the work of the DAO. And it kind of started with, I think, Eve Safari um, as well, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of Eve Safari, the community that's being built uh, there? Yes, 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 absolutely. So Eve Safari was formed by, came out of an idea from Jason, Jason Asin, who's uh, what, who I call the grandfather of blockchain in the continent. Uh, He's old basically. and he looks old. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he, he came up with this idea. Can we do, you know, we have all these ETH events across the rest of the world and somehow Africa is always left behind even though we have the highest peer-to-peer engagement in terms of transfer of of BTC and Ethereum uh, we have the highest number of users who use peer-to-peer transaction platforms such as local bitcoins and uh, uh, local Ethereum and similar platforms and that's why even companies like Binance are having such a great time on the continent. And so it just felt a little bit unfair that all these other countries are having the opportunities to meet up and share ideas. 
And so the founders of Eat Safari came together and said, let's hold this uh, first event. Let's see how many people can come across. And it was very successful because 14 nationalities were represented. We had people coming in all the way from the Far East, all the way from the Far West, all coming to take part in this first of a kind uh, event on the continent. And that's not to discount all the other events which had which have existed because we've had a couple of blockchain events and but this one was specifically special because it was coming at a time when the engagement with with uh, with with blockchain as a service was growing in the in the industry. So now, yeah, so, and now there's Safari, uh, East Safari. I think there will be Don Safari coming up as well. So it's a really kind of very big community and starting to really be an active community, um, not only in terms of events, but I guess like because I was kind of hearing talks about hackathons. So it's really about, I guess, one, spreading the community to, to, to the diversity of, of the continent uh, and really a grassroots type of thing as well. Yes, 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 absolutely. You know, I was having this discussion with one of my friends today. Uh, so initially, when I started try doing integrations with companies, local companies, I would get so frustrated because uh, the devel developers were not building in good time. They were not meeting some of the deadlines that I expected. But... This was without looking at the larger picture. If you think about Kenya, for example, the oldest sets of software engineers who maybe might be proficient in what we're doing today have only been in the market for maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not to discount all the computer scientists who came, who came before. But if you're looking at the modern developer, we're just now getting into the space where we have this unlimited access to information, the ability to uh, take part in global projects. And that that is now being bridged by opportunities like Eat Safari and Dot Safari because we're now taking part in the global uh, learning and development. And it's because of the information age. Uh, the internet has been so powerful. And this is where if we use these tools to make sure that we are solving local problems, solving uh, the, creating local solutions to those local problems, we'll be able to really uh, get our continent to, the, to where it should be. That's absolutely fantastic. That's a great ambition. Uh, but it, really, that's all the time we have now, but thank you for kind of um, sharing with us actually ultimately the vision and the mission of what you guys are trying to um, to do um, on the continent and really making an impact there. Awesome, Zach.